Hello and welcome to episode 279 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Stateline, Nevada. I'm Nathan Fox with me in Vienna, Virginia, Ben Olson. What's happening, Ben? The nation's capital is under siege. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's weird. I, I don't have a reaction to these things because I generally am disconnected from news and just trying to do my thing, right? Right. But when I saw those images and all the shit that was going down, I was just like, this, this is ridiculous. Like, it's so weird. It's like, we've been drawn into this slowly. Like if, if this had happened right four years ago, people would be so shocked that yeah, there'd be immediate totally. action. But it's like, you it's become to expect in it. The, in the pot of boiling water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I had a, a buddy of mine texted me like, what's going on in DC? And I, I, I didn't, I hadn't even looked at the news yet. And I glanced like at Twitter and saw what was going on. And I was like, well, this asshole has been trying to incite violence for four years plus now. I mean, before he ever even ran for the presidency, he, yeah, yeah. He has been making these incendiary remarks and, you know, like, I don't see how anybody can be that surprised that there's now actually a mob of idiots, basically, with Trump flags, Trump flags and Confederate flags, dude, <laughs> flying outside the Capitol and Trump's like talking to them. <laughs> They're special air quotes there. Special people. <laughs> I mean, well, just a bunch of fucking losers, honestly. Um. Well, you know, the good news is the way our system works, everything swings back and forth. I talk about this all the time. It's like, it, it's why yeah. none, nothing matters, essentially, to me. It's like, well, hey, we had the first black president. Then you swings back the other way and you get a complete racist buffoon. Then next thing you know, the presidency and the House and the Senate are all back in the hands of the Democrats. So that's the way our system works. And it's, yep. it's super annoying. I, I mean, it's a, it's a shame and it's embarrassing for sure. Mm. But um, thankfully, our system is built to, uh, I don't know. Now, my other friends were like, are you watching this? They texted me, are you watching this? I was like, fuck no, I'm not watching this. I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, actually doing work yesterday. I was like, nah, yeah. I'd, I'd tune all this bullshit out. God. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. well, I'm glad you're far enough away from the capital that you're not uh, at risk of getting tear gassed or bombed. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a good, uh, 25 30 minute drive so yeah you're a it would take piece. a lot of work for people to march <laughs> over here but <laughs> yeah cool uh today on the show yeah. we have a pearls versus turds i've heard this one a lot about using the acceptability question before you do your setup in logic games Okay. You know You've heard this one. Glance yeah, yeah. at the mm -hmm. list question. Yep, and yep. Then I do your probably setup. even have said it, but yeah, let's yeah. take a look. Okay. Um, we have an email about fee waivers and standing desks. We have a PSA from our man, Matt Dumont, uh, <coughs> about 1Ls, uh, PSA for 1Ls, basically a book recommendation for uh, incoming 1Ls from our man, Matt Dumont. And you should probably take Matt's advice. Um, based on how much he kicked ass in his first semester at the University of Maryland Law. Um, let's see, an email asking whether someone else can submit your applications for you. <laughs> what does an that email mean? about what work they should do between now and the next application cycle. And then we have a, an actual LSAT question from prep test 65, uh, a logical reasoning question. So that's all this fun. This show will air on Monday, January 11th, which means we're five days away from the start of the January LSAT flex testing week. February LSAT flex testing week is coming up um, end of February, the 20th of February. The deadline for that has already passed because of the ridiculously long registration windows 
imposed by the Law School Admission Council. Uh, if you're hearing this right now and you're not signed up for a test, your next opportunity to sign up or your next opportunity to take the test is going to be the week of April 10th. Um, that is so crazy. You're sitting yeah. here right now and you're like, oh, I want to take the LSAT. Okay, well, you got three months. Yep. The soonest you can take it, if you're not currently registered, the soonest you can take the test is three months from now. Wow. Um, by the way, you have to sign up for that by February 24th. So that's, a, again, a solid six-week lead time there for uh, LSAC to make sure that they're able to administer their online test to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, we do not um, have any sort of logistical challenges that we did in the past. What? <laughs> easier. <laughs> so much easier. Well, it's funny because they, uh, because of COVID, and they got all their live classes got completely shut down. Mm -hmm. They responded within like a month and launched the LSAT flex, or maybe it wasn't a month, but it felt like a month. It felt like it was like pretty much immediately the flex. Yeah, it was, was I feel like it was May, right? Or May, yeah, I feel like the May <laughs> test was flex. Yeah. Like they canceled, did they even cancel an official, maybe they did cancel like one official in-person test or something, but then immediately they did. replaced yeah, it the with, April the, one. with mm -hmm. the flex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since then, yeah. how much innovation have we seen? None. <laughs> Absolutely zero. Oh, they no, no, forced... wait, wait. We saw the score preview. <laughs> oh, yeah. A new product that they charge more money for. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like they were forced to make this change, which they did almost immediately. But then now lead times haven't changed. Score release times haven't changed. Nothing has gotten better about it. <laughs> this is like, oh God, amazing. Anyway. Hey, um, so, sorry, this is a tangent, but have you been getting those emails asking you or informing you about their board leadership vote or something like that? <laughs> they probably blocked me a long time ago. All right. Uh, Are they inviting I, I, you to be on the board? That's good. Well, no, no, there. Well, I actually, I don't read them. So, but the <laughs> gist I get from the email is we're electing officers for the board for LSAC and we want to be open and transparent and let the community know. And I'm sitting here thinking, like, wh what? Like, I, I want to do with this in what way? Like, it's anyways. It's I don't get those emails. Easy. I think they might have got tired of me mocking them on the show. And everybody knows that you're like nicer. And so that you did, you haven't raised the red flags over there. Uh, yeah. Anyway, if you uh, get emails from law school admission council that you would like us to discuss on the show, you can email us help at thinking .com. You can also ask us any question. Obviously we build our show agendas based on listener emails. So um, please do talk to us. We've been getting more emails these days, which is great. Help at thinkinglsat.com. It helps us to keep the show fresh. Um, just send us whatever you've been working on. Personal statement submissions, um, any kinds of questions at all. Help at thinkinglsat.com. Cool. Um, Hey, we do have uh, episode 300 coming up. We, on the hundreds, well, at least the last hundred, episode 200, we did like a best of show. Um, if you have any favorite moments, clips, funny things, useful things, um, just send a, an episode number and a timestamp and a little description of the topic. And uh, our team will create those clips so that we can have a good uh, highlight show for episode 300. Again, just email that to help at thinkinglsat.com if you want to do us a favor. Yeah, including like interviewees you really enjoyed. We could grab a clip from them. Totally. Yeah, anything that you liked in the last 100 episodes of the show. So please email help at thinkinglsat.com. Um, did we already do this PSA about not reading aloud on the LSAT or the LSAT Flex? We did. Okay, you can't read aloud on the LSAT or LSAT Flex. But, and I haven't confirmed this, I haven't fact-checked this, but I did get an email or might have been a comment in class from a student. You can get accommodated to read out loud on the LSAT Flex. Yeah, I've, I'm pretty sure I've heard of that. So I think you're right. So normal people 
or <laughs> if you're a typical standard test taker, you will not be allowed to read aloud on the LSAT Flex. However, if you apply for accommodations, you can have extra time, you can have longer breaks, you can read out loud, you can do whatever you want, apparently. Um, just a PSA. All right, um, pearls versus turds. You want to uh, drive on this one? I will, sure. Pearls versus turds, 10 pearls, 41 turds, 21 ties. That's the current scoreboard. So we haven't Oof. seen a lot of pearls on the show, but Sam writes, I think I have a pearl. If you are setting up a logic game and there are two equally reasonable ways of setting it up, say assigning locations to people versus people to locations, glance at the acceptability question, which is presumably the first question, and see how they set it up. It'll be easier, at least for that question, to set it up their way. So um, let's try to personalize yeah. it a little bit. Okay. If the game was, um, we got uh, three COVID vaccination sites and six people who are gonna get the vaccine. You could list out the people and then assign them a location mm -hmm. or you could list out the location and then make lists of people who were going to go to that location i mean mm -hmm. that's sam's specific example is assigning locations yep. to people or people to locations mm -hmm. um i don't think there's actually two good ways of setting that up uh, maybe sam's example isn't that great because okay if each person is, well, I guess if people were going to go to multiple locations, then, then we might have a, a conundrum, right? But if each person is only going to go to one location, mm -hmm. then I think it's pretty clear that you want locations to be the base and you want to build groups of people that are going to each of those locations. It would be kind of stupid to list out all six people and then one location for each one. <laughs> You're not actually grouping if you do that, right? Yeah. Uh, I guess a better example would be if each person is going to go twice. Because they have you to get, get vaccinated twice. twice. Yep. <laughs> Let's say the government geniuses decide that you have to go to two different locations. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get you have to go to one location, and then you have to go to a different location. I mean, mm -hmm. in that case, I could see how I would be like, well shit should i do locations and then lists of people or should i do people and then and then there are two locations. location one location two i think that would depend on whether locations could accept more than a certain number of people right like if it's fluid you might want to take that into account yeah i i'm going to put in a provisional vote for turd on this tip because I understand it, but for every time that it's helpful, I think there's going to be another time where it's actually going to hurt you. I think they intentionally lay out that list question or that acceptability question. I think they intentionally lay it out in convoluted ways sometimes. I agree. I've actually thought of a game um, or I, I, I actually can't think of it right now, but I, I know I've been in class and it's like, hey, you set up the game, Ben, and it's like different than the way the first question is set up. And I'm like, yeah, right. I mean, it just makes a lot more sense. I have to kind of like work right. through this first question and it's a little frustrating to keep translating each of these answers back to my diagram and what they mean. But the rest of the questions are so much easier and this game makes sense to me. Um, and then I know there are other cases where, yeah, like it was felt arbitrary and it was kind of nice that my diagram happened to match their setup, at least in that question. I think, um, yeah, I have to agree with you. I, I think there are cases where it helps and cases where it hurts. And so it's not advice that would be like, I, yes, do this. I would say that people, I actually, when you first read this in the agenda, like highlights, I was thinking that this advice was like, look at the first question to help you decide how to set up. I, I think I've told people that in the sense that if they don't have any clue what's going on, 
looking right. at a question can give them like a concrete example right. and then you like oh okay so really what they're trying to figure but out then is you still don't have to set it up the exact way that they have it set up in that acceptability exactly question. yeah it's more just to like continue to understand and get your mind wrapped around what the hell is going yeah. on i i tend to use a rule mm -hmm. as the deciding factor for how i'm going to set something up you know, like there, there will be one rule or maybe a couple rules in combination and I'll go, oh, okay, well, the easiest way to represent this in a diagram would be whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, that's, but that's my deciding factor, not n never just the, how they set up that acceptability question. Yeah, yeah I, I got to say turd here. I, I would never recommend anybody do this and I think it's going to hurt you probably more often than it's going to help you for most people because I can just see students taking this too far and relying on it and going like oh okay I know I'm just going to always shit I won't even read the rules I'll just I'll just look at the acceptability question first and then that'll be my setup and then I'll read the rules I mean I know that's not what Sam specifically meant Oh, but people are going to do that. That's the thing. They're going to take right. this advice and they're going to be like, oh, well, look at that first question. You got problems. When is when that first question is not an acceptability question, but you're the kind of test taker yeah. that's looking to it. You're like, right. oh, okay, well, this is a little strange, but okay. And then you have the other case where it's also not an acceptability question, or you could, I don't know what they mean by acceptability, but um, you know, those questions where it's like only a partial list. It's not the complete list. It's only a partial list, but they give it to yeah. you first. And There's it's, so it's many ways this can much go different, wrong. But people are like, wait, okay. And then they're basing it off of that. Yeah. I, yeah, I would let this go. You, this reminds me of that one game. I mean, this is a tangent, but you know that one where it's like, I, it's like top to bottom. I don't remember what the topic was, but the answers like flipped it. Oh, sure. They do shit like that it's, all the time. Yeah. People always like get so pissed by that one game because they're like top to bottom. And then in the answer A, it's and like then, lists bottom at the top yep, and then from middle, bottom and then, to the top. Yeah. And you're like, why the hell did they do that? And it's like, well, that person was who, whatever contractor wrote well, that question was just pissed off that day. It's like, <laughs> I'm going to fuck with these people. Well, they want you to be able to solve the system, right? They always give yep. you enough information that you can't solve the system and you can answer every question perfectly. That said, they intentionally write the questions in such a way that if you don't read them carefully, you're going to get confused. That's why instead of every question saying which one of the following could be true, some of the questions say each of the following must be false, except. Except. Yep. They could right? ask I mean, it in a clearer way, not, but they don't. Yeah. They're not trying to help you on the questions. And so that's yeah. essentially what Sam's doing here is looking to the question to help sort out the system and i just don't know turd thank you sam thanks sam um you know and i mean I, I guess we could also probably acknowledge that sam sounds sophisticated enough mm -hmm. that it might help him or her sometimes yeah. yeah and so whatever if it's working for you i think you know this question is savvy enough that sam probably understands what they're talking about yeah but as an LSAT teacher, it's a turd. I we would never recommend anybody do this. So it's no turd. Yeah. All right. Standing desk and fee waivers. This is from Andy, a current LSAT demon student. Uh, Andy's been around with us for a while in the demon uh, live classes and everything else. Hi guys. Okay. What a fucking year it has been. Attached, you'll find my fee waiver. I did a hilariously dumb thing and applied for it the week before October scores came out. They halted my account on appeal, what you officially agree to, and I didn't get to see my score when October scores came out. And then I didn't get to see my scores until November came out. And then I didn't get to see my scores until winter solstice, which was the 21st of December. Wow. Okay. Also, University of Little Rock will tell you your scores in their phishing emails, which is how I first found out that I got a 160. 
Oh, that's Whoa. interesting. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> Andy, so damn. So Andy applied for the fee waiver. And then I'm not sure whether he appealed or not, but he ended up getting his October score delayed all the way until the middle of December. I don't understand why they put a hold on your account because they don't want to refund you the money that you end up paying or why not just say, well, uh, we'll give you a fee waiver and apply those discounts as soon as your fee waiver becomes active, but all previous things are paid for if you want to pay for them. Like, I, I don't understand the hold. The only explanation for most of the stuff they do is because they can why they or, would do or it no you, one thought it <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know they seem you know but this is rampant in the world today people doing things that seem to cause themselves extra work right there's just like so many bad customer service things so much shit that's so poorly explained and it's like what are you doing you're trying to fuck yourself basically you, i don't because i mean i would yeah. just imagine that what this policy is gonna cause is people like andy to call them every day and send them a million emails i don't for what i don't get it anyway i missed a lot of admission deadlines from this ordeal and i'm proud of my 160 although i realize its limitations along with not sending out my official apps until December 23rd. Okay. I'm starting a new job, first time legal assistant in a new city on Monday and in the quote, just hanging out time, I'm deciding to take the April LSAT so I can try to bump those rookie numbers into something awesome. If it means I have to spend another year waiting around for law school, well, maybe I'll get another shot at some better schools. I'm one of those COVID people who had to move across the country and lost a bunch. So another year of my life making a little more moolah to give to law school. And he wrote law school as one word with a dollar sign S. <laughs> another year okay. of my life making a little more moolah to give to law school hardly seems like a prison sentence. Let's hope I have some good instincts. And with that book attached is my LSAC fee waiver approval. May I please get a promo code for the demon? Parentheses, whatever the options are for a shit kicking fee waiver queen like myself. Thanks and praise the yada, 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 Andy. <laughs> Any thoughts, Ben? Uh, I'm glad that Andy is open to taking another year to bring up his 160 because, uh, I mean, I'm assuming he won't take a year to do that, but uh, I mean, whatever the system is, the system is, and LSAT is just worth a lot of money. A score is worth a lot of money. I just, people don't want to spend the time, but you just can't make that kind of money anywhere else at this age. Yeah, Andy, um, I, I didn't see this bottom part. It's a and Andrew Hafko Hafkowitz. I bet that's pretty close. Hafkowitz. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the signature, it's educator slash writer slash performer. Andy's a comedian. P.S. Well, before I get to the P.S., I think it's clear that Andy should retake the LSAT and reapply for law school at the beginning of the next cycle. Yep. I don't, 160 is not that great. It's like, good job. I'm glad you made it that far. But with another few months of studying, I think 165 is in range. And with a 165, you're gonna get like tens of thousands of dollars more money at whatever school the 160 is gonna get you into. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're, you've got the fee waiver now. So you're, by the way, Andy's taking advantage of our fairly generous fee waiver program. If you get approved for the law school admission council fee waiver, send us um, just a PDF or whatever screenshot of the fee waiver approval. And we'll give you 
four months of Demon Basic for free. Well, a thirty dollar yeah. LSAC license fee. Four months though of Demon Basic for yeah. essentially nothing. Yeah. Uh, we'll also give you twenty percent off if you want to do a premium or a live subscription. It's worth a lot of money. The the LSAC fee waiver. Now that Andy's got it, I think he should take advantage of that. Retake the LSAT once or maybe even twice. There's no reason for Andy to like push for the April test necessarily if he decides he wants to wait another cycle. Although it's three months from now and there's no point in dragging it out. He could, yeah, and he could take it again after that in the summer as well. And still be right? early. Yeah. The fee waiver gives you two free LSATs. So um <clears throat> yeah, I, I would I would be more like study your ass off for three months, take it in April, take it again sometime this summer, apply smarter. He already applied late. I mean, he already applied in at Christmas. Yeah. Which is middle of the cycle. You know, so many people already had scholarships in hand before Andy even sent in his application. Not his fault. But sometimes <clears throat> shitty things like this can be the best thing that ever happened to an applicant yeah right if this forces him to study a little longer apply with a better lsat score mm -hmm. it's probably the best thing the best thing that could have happened and I, so i would be much more comfortable if i see andy apply with a 165 in september i just <clears throat> hands down yeah um p.s heard on the show yesterday about standing desks it's Proctor U that will yay or nay that request. And they have always approved on the day and when asking for tech support beforehand. Okay, so what Andy's saying is no standing desk has ever been denied by Proctor U. And there is the thing that it's probably recommended, honestly, that people check their, uh, <coughs> check their setup with Proctor U before the day of the test. Yeah, dude, people in class were talking about the other night that they took the official test and they have an iMac with the camera built into the computer. Yep. And the Proctor U Proctor asked them to like pick up the entire iMac in order to show around the room. Okay. I'm pretty sure you could also be like, I can't. And they probably would say, okay, <laughs> but. <laughs> but they could also, depending on what poorly trained Proctor U Proctor you get, they could be like, I'm sorry, I have to see your whole room. Yeah, that's interesting. You I can't take the test. Light. <laughs> no, I mean, and some of them are built in or like there's plenty of circumstances where people wouldn't just purely wouldn't be able to pick up the thing and <laughs> show it around the room. Okay. <laughs> anyway, you can get a tech check apparently in advance if you call Proctor U or email them or whatever and tell them you're concerned about your setup and you want to make sure that you're good to go for the test. Um, then they can also approve your standing desk. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Next one. Yeah. So this is from Matt Dumont who has been with the show for a long time before he ever became a, a demon team member, a demon tutor, a demon teacher. He uh, listened to the show. He sent in his personal statement, which we read on the show. He's also the reason we, that personal statement is also the reason we hired Matt. And Matt has since gone on to law school and this is what he recommends. Check out the book, Getting a Running Start, Your Comprehensive Guide to the First Year Curriculum. He writes, it's a primer that I would have been, that would have been super, super useful to read in July, August for the upcoming classes. I'm reading it now for my spring classes and I'm really appreciative of the broad strokes and nuance it provides of the different doctrinal courses for 1L. Um... Yeah. So anyways, that's the book. He's saying, get it before you go to law school. It's called Getting a Running Start, Your Comprehensive Guide to the First Year Curriculum. He I, also got 
four A's and two A minuses in his first semester 1L classes. He sent yeah. us the grades yesterday. He was all pumped about it. Um, he thinks he's in like the top 10 of his entire 300 person class or whatever it is at uh, University of Maryland Law. So Matt killed it without the book, but Matt's telling you, you should read the book. If you're an incoming 1L, you should probably read the book. Dude, um, don't let this bu book become an excuse not to bump up your LSAT score. I could see some people excitedly getting ready for school. Oh. <laughs> getting the edge. Yeah, it's not an edge if you're at like a school that you don't need to be at <laughs> or paying yeah. more than you should be. No, you so. can read all these books once you're already done with the LSAT and admitted with a scholarship to whatever school you want to go to. I mean, Matt went to the University of Maryland for free. <laughs> yeah. By the way, going to University of Maryland for free is one of the best ways you can ensure that you're going to get good grades at the University of Maryland. Yep. Just because it means that you're probably like overqualified, not overqualified, but you're among the most qualified people in your class. That's why they gave you the scholarship. And when yeah. you're among the most qualified people in the class, then you have a much better chance. I mean, don't get me wrong. You still have to bust your absolute ass, <laughs> you know, in order to get those grades and probably get a little bit lucky, but I'm sure that the scholarship kids have on average much better grades than the people who didn't get a scholarship. So, yeah. Well, and to double down on that, I mean, we keep, we constantly preach don't pay for law school, but look how Matt has set himself up. Yeah. He's not paying for law school, so he's going to leave with very little or no debt. Yeah. I mean, you still have living expenses. And he's going to be in the top of his class, most likely. Yeah. Which means he's going to get better job opportunities, not have that much debt, stress-free. I mean, he's just he, doing yeah. everything that's going to set himself up to <laughs> yeah. clean the competition. Yeah. Now he could have gone to a marginally better school, be mm -hmm. better, mar mm -hmm. marginally higher ranked. It wouldn't even have been, it's not like he had the opportunity to go to Yale and he turned Yale down. Right. Mm -hmm. He, he, he could have gone to some slightly better school paid full price and not been positioned to compete as well as he was in his classes. Which probably means, end up in the middle of his class. Or yeah, which means he wouldn't bottom. have gotten the best opportunities that that school had to offer anyway. You know, if he yep. would have gone to Georgetown or whatever, he sure, it's a better school. Sure, they have better opportunities. But the best opportunities at Georgetown go to the people who finish in the top of the class. And I'm not saying Matt wouldn't have been able to finish in the top of the class at Georgetown, but he's a much better bet to finish in the top of the class at Maryland. Yeah. And it's just harder as if the competition's just way harder. And so, and you'd be taking on an immense financial risk. You know, it'd yep. be like, he'd be signed up to graduate with $300,000 of debt and have a harder time with the academic competition. Instead, he's going to graduate with like no debt and kick ass while he's there. And they're going to give him all, he's going to have all kinds of opportunities as yeah. a star at that school. It's just a much better way to go. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> don't pay for law school. Then once you're already signed up on your full ride, get this book, get a, Getting a Running Start, your comprehensive guide to the first year curriculum and read it uh, before you start law school. I also would suggest, you know, those people who tell us they want to go to law school because they want to like be a better citizen or learn about the law. Mm. Those people that we're always pretty much like, Oh, you, you shouldn't go to law school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They could still get this book and read it. Yeah. It's a comprehensive guide to the first year curriculum. <laughs> Dude, I bet 25 you learn, bucks. How much is it? I bet you learn everything that really matters in that book. Yeah. I mean, everything that matters to anybody other than a lawyer who's going to practice in that area. 
You know, I just, when people tell me, I'm not sure I want to practice law, but I want to go to law school so I can learn about the law. Okay. Yeah. Read Wikipedia or read that book. Please, dear God, don't start paying $50,000 a year of tuition so that you can learn about the law. This, t- this book is $50. 50? <laughs> 50. Dang. As opposed to 50,000. So oh. even though it's a high priced <laughs> book, right? I'm like, but you could probably get a used version of it on eBay for $5, or you could probably get it from the library for $0. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, even if you have to pay full price, that's uh, still a much better bet than. And if you hate it, then don't go to law school. Yeah. That because, was the best $50 you ever spent. <laughs> yeah. No shit. Three years of your life is worth a lot more than even the $50,000 anyway. So, Mm -hmm. you know, don't waste time in law school like I did. I completely wasted time in law school. I had no interest in law school. Wasted time and money in law school. And if I would have probably read more shit like this, I would have been like, ooh, I don't like this stuff. (laughs) I don't want, shouldn't go. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, Yep. Fall 2021 application. Hello, I plan to apply next September, but have an opportunity to go to officer candidate school for the army from June to November. Is there a way I can have someone else submit all of my application stuff when it's available to be received in September or does it have to be me? It would, of course, be created by me. Thanks, Jay. What do you think? Uh, I'm con. Yeah, I, I I don't see a problem with someone going into uh, your credential assembly service and submitting all these applications for you, especially as long as you answer all the questions. My question is. Are the applications for the following cycle released by June? And if they're not, you could run into a problem where if you are completely inaccessible, then there may be a question or some random part of the application that that person does not know the answer to, or you have not provided an answer for, and um, they can't complete that application. Is that Yeah, it, it would need to be every application is a little bit different and there's a lot of optional questions, optional essays. I, you know, if you can get your hands on this year's application for Mm -hmm. all of those schools, I suppose you could do a complete response for every single question. And then you just have to have like, whoever's going to do this for you has to be your smartest, most trusted friend or family member. They also have to be willing to do a lot of little detailed. Oh, it's a pain in the ass. (laughs) Is it? Yeah. You're going to owe them many beers when you get back from yeah. officer Canada school. Yep. Um, that's, that's the challenge you're facing, but yeah. are you completely inaccessible? Can they not ask you like a couple of questions here and there? Like, Oh, by the way, this application added this one technical question. What is your, you know, I don't know. What's the size of your right earlobe? Um, please tell me. <laughs> Like I like where I, I can't imagine. Yeah. I like where Jay's head's at though, because you know, Jay is clearly understanding the importance of trying to apply at the beginning of the cycle, all mm-hmm. else equal. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it is going to be a lot of work, man. If you take our advice and you apply to 15 schools, there's going to be a lot of annoying hoops to jump through copying and pasting and, this person's going to have to have all of your information and all of your responses to all of the conceivable questions. I mean, and they're going to have to, they're going to have to pay attention to detail, right? You don't you want someone of, copying and pasting. Right. Blindly just, yeah. Put the wrong personal statement for the wrong school. Nah. I mean, Jay should only be using one personal statement anyway, probably almost everybody. Um, Letters of recommendation you can do in advance. Transcripts you can do in advance. LSAT will be done. Yeah, you just need a super detail-oriented 
super anal, super smart, super trusted friend to do all this stuff for you. Yeah. I mean, I, there's probably like electronic signatures and stuff, but right. I would imagine, but that's, yeah. I mean, I don't see a problem with yeah. grabbing a signature image and putting it in there. Yeah. You want to think through all that stuff well in advance. All right. Thanks, Jay. Yep. Good luck. Let us know how that goes. Um, or if you have any follow-ups, let us know. Help at thinkingalset.com. Um, cool. Work between now and the application cycle. Hello, Ben and Nathan. After listening to your advice on the podcast, I decided to wait a year and apply next September for law school in 2022. Nice. I realized that it was too late in the application process and that I need a little bit more time to get my ideal LSAT score. I was hoping that you both had some input about what I could do for work between now and September of 2022. Okay, so it's a decent amount of time. Um, a year and a half. Is there any specific job I should look into to help my law school application? This may be a more general question, but what do you guys think is the best way to spend a year and a half before law school? Um, well, someone actually asked me this question just the other night in my class, and I told them, well, I don't know what you should do, but the two pieces of advice that I came up with at the time was one, consider getting a legal job at a law firm, not to increase your chances of getting admitted, but to know whether you really want to pursue this career. Um, because if you do that and you hate what your attorneys at your firm are doing, then yeah, it sucks. You wasted a year of your time doing this job and you're applying to law yeah, school and, and now you're not going to go, but you just saved would, yourself a lot of pain. Right. And if you are sure that you really do want to do like big law, let's say, absolutely get a job as a paralegal in a big law setting, but you're not doing that because it enhances your law school application, you're doing that because it's the beginning of your legal career. Yep. And you're, you're doing that because you want to make contacts mm -hmm. and learn shit about practice so that you can be more savvy when you interview for jobs during your 1L year. Totally. You're going to know what firms are looking for. You're going to understand the culture better than you would have. You're also going to do better in your law school classes because you're not going to have a whole new set of vocabulary words to learn. You're going to be like, oh yeah, I'm actually a little bit familiar with that. I still have a lot to learn, but it's not going to be the same as a lot of your newbie colleagues. You have to be open to the possibility though, that you, you try, you, you like go into this. Mm-hmm. And it turns out not to be what you thought it was. Yeah. And then you have to quit. You ha and you have to just, you ha I really, I can't recommend enough that you just quit whatever. It just try something else. This is like kill it. your darlings, right? Yeah. You know, I, my own career path, I'm not going to talk about the entire thing, but like in college, I was a, kind of like a finance guy and I really enjoyed like investments and stocks and bonds and all that type of stuff. I got a job right out of college as a stockbroker. Seems like a dream scenario. This is what I've been doing all throughout school. This is what I, yeah. I had an internship. This is what I'm interested in. I got that job and I absolutely hated it. And I only lasted like six months, maybe nine months. And it was really hard but I quit. And then I did that. I ended up doing that several more times because you just don't know what it's going to be like until you actually do it. I mean, I wanted for a while, I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I have a, I had a journalism while I was in journalism school yeah. and I'm a baseball fan. Yep. I got a freelance gig working for this website, baseball prospectus. I was living in Boston at the time. I had a press pass from Baseball Prospectus to Fenway Park. I could go to all the Red Sox games. I could go down on the field. I go all around, talk to, you know, it's like all these baseball heroes. Dream scenario, right? 
hated it. Just hated it. <laughs> didn't yeah. like, turned out I didn't like going and asking people uncomfortable questions. I didn't like writing on a deadline. I didn't, I just didn't enjoy it. Yeah. And thankfully I quit. And, and because, and I mean, the, I guess the punchline of the story is eventually after trying and hating and quitting like 10 different jobs, I ended up randomly teaching LSAT and falling in love with it. And, and not only loving it, but because I love it being pretty successful in it. Yeah. And it's like, I just, I just really wish that more people would quit shit that they don't like, you know, instead of like trying to force it. So to, yeah, to get back to our advice for F, if you're going to get a law job, it's not, it's not, for at all for law school applications it's entirely for figuring out whether this is actually the right fit for you and if it is the right fit for you then great you're going to be off to the races and making contacts and you know building up a legal resume for future legal work but not at all for applications i mean not only that but presumably f is going to apply in september of this year for september of the following year admission so the time between now and then is only eight months anyway. How impressive is eight months on your resume to law schools? It can't, it can't be. Yeah. I mean, you're competing against other paralegals and legal secretaries and that type of thing who have eight years of experience on their resume. That's impressive to schools. Your eight months is not going to be impressive yeah. for applications. What if F wasn't going to get a legal job? Well, that was my second piece of advice. And that yeah. was to go for a job. Look at job openings in your area or actually these days, really anywhere you're willing to go or willing, willing to work remotely. And um, I suggested finding the most challenging job that that person can get. Ooh. That's interesting to them. Like if, if you see a job and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool, or at least cool on some level. It doesn't need to be your passion. I think that's a little crazy, a little bit like over celebrated in America. Like, oh, I'm going to find the job that I'm passionate about. Yes, I agree with what you were just saying. You should find a job that you like, but a lot of jobs aren't going to be like passionate, right? No, but, but try shit that you think you are interested in that you think you could be successful in, you know, like, yes. don't try shit that you think you're going to hate. Yep. Try shit that you think you're going to like. But tell yep. me about the challenging bit. Why are you suggesting that? Well, personally, a couple of reasons. One, um, for the actual application, if you can, if like you have an opportunity to use your time, right? And you haven't applied yet, go get a job that's a little more than just packing sandwiches at Subway, right? Like go get something where you can actually push yourself and that might give you something to write about in your personal statement. But even that's not the main motivation. My real motivation here is just you're building yourself, right? Like go get a job in which you're going to go to work and actually move the ball forward in some way, shape or form. And if nothing else, just become a more competent player in your life, in your career, et cetera. I mean, I think it also provides more interesting fodder for your personal statement, but why not grow? Why waste this time, especially when you're younger and you're going to be quitting this job in a year and a half anyway. So make the most of it. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a couple other ideas. One would be is there anything else that you can do that would be a lucrative career that's not law mm -hmm. where maybe you could get that job and start working in it for a while and see how it is because lawyers mm -hmm. don't on average make as much money or like the mode, I should say, like the, sure. the typical lawyer doesn't make as much money as you think they make like the yep. all the bulk of the real money goes to 
big law lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, try other jobs um, on our Slack channel, or on our, on our Slack for the LSAT demon. And we have a whole channel of jobs without JDs. We did an episode, I think it was back in early December, maybe late November. Mm -hmm. We did a whole episode on jobs without JDs. Um, Demon Tutor Katie helpfully provided a whole list of different legal related jobs that you you can do. Um, Tons of immigration jobs. I can't even remember what the whole list was court navigation assistance there's there's a whole we had a whole podcast about it and a whole there's a whole channel on our slack but you might be able to try one of those jobs which many of them pay as much as starting lawyers make anyway then it's like two birds with one stone because you're kind of checking out the legal world but you're making the salary of a normal like low level lawyer you might discover you love it get recommitted to law school and have some contacts to bring with you, you might decide you hate it. You might decide you love it and don't need to go to law school. Yeah. So, yeah, I I guess I would just continue the exploration. I mean, so many people get to law school and then then discover that they don't really want to practice law. So if anything you can do to either try out non-law things or try out law things that might not require a JD. Yeah. What, what is it that you're interested in? You know, go, yeah. go pursue those things. Experiment. I agree, Ben. I, I didn't, I didn't say passionate about, I said, what, what are you interested? What do yeah. you think you're interested in? Go, go check those things out. All right. Yeah. Cool. I wish I had an exact reference for that uh, podcast episode, but. I don't see it here offhand. Okay. Ready to move on? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Um, This is an LSAT question, logical reasoning question from prep test 65. One of the few um, questions that our law school admission council license will allow us to talk about freely. Yeah. Well, not freely. We pay them five thousand dollars a year to be able to talk about these one hundred and fifty questions. Yeah. Yeah. If you wonder why LSAT prep is so expensive, um, (laughs) the Law School Admission Council does not make it cheap. Yeah. Um, Okay. So you want to uh, read this argument? Sure. So there are two people. By the way, this is uh, Test 65, Section 4, Question 16, if I didn't already say that. Go ahead. Awesome. Critic to economist is the first person. This critic says, in yet another of your bumbling forecasts. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I mean, this person, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. There's no so way pers- you would just read that and keep going without having like a you'd have some thoughts, wouldn't you? Yeah, uh, several thoughts. And most of my thoughts, by the way, are pretty short and simple, but that's why I feel like I understand. One, there's an economist who's making a forecast, right? Okay. That's one thought. Um, apparently, this economist has made several forecasts in yet another. This critic is disagreeing with some aspect of that forecast and at the same time, accusing the economist of being bumbling, unclear, wrong, you know, et cetera. It's the word choice that does it for me. You know, in, yeah. in LSAT reading comprehension, I, I, I'm always struck by how much one word can say. Sure. And the class, you know, because they're racing through they do it on logical reasoning as well because they're racing through they don't notice the choices that the author is making this critic did not need to include the word bumbling at all yeah they could have just said 
in another of your forecasts or in one of your forecasts or in your latest forecast. Yep. And even if they were going to be mildly insulting, they didn't need to use the word bumbling. Yeah. Right. In another of your misguided. Yeah. Yeah. In another incorrect, incomplete. I don't know. There's a lot of other words they could have used that wouldn't be quite so aggressive as bumbling. And it's important to just get the the tone and the, you know, what does this critic want? Well, shit, this critic definitely came here to insult this economist. All right. The critic continues. In yet another of your bumbling forecasts, last year you predicted that this country's economy would soon go into recession if current economic policies were not changed. Okay, so last year, this economist that the critic is going against said, hey, we're going to go into a recession. If we don't change things, specifically our current economic policies, the critic continues. So I'm, I'm assuming that this didn't happen. Well, instead, there's two yeah. parts to that, right? You sure. predicted that, the, that there would be a recession if the policies weren't changed. Yep. And you know, the lawyer in the room, because the lawyer in the room, their ears perked up the second this critic said bumbling. Yep. All of a sudden now this economist has an attorney. Yep. And the attorney is like, oh really? This was a bumbling forecast? What was, ex- what was the forecast exactly? The forecast was yeah. recession if economic policies aren't changed. Yep. And the lawyer goes, okay, there's two elements there. Was there a recession? And were the economic policies changed? Mm -hmm. That's very law school, by the way, the elements of the, right? There's like, yeah. How many prongs are there? (laughs) This critic is accusing the economist of a crime. The crime Mm -hmm. is making a bumbling forecast. The forecast had two elements to it. One recession, two predicated on if economic policies aren't changed. Yep. So, in order to accuse the economist of being wrong, we have to have a recession and the economic policies have to not be changed. Yep. Sorry, wait, that would be, that would be correct. That would make the economist correct. Oh, uh, not a recession. The opposite if... of those. We have to have the economic policies remaining the same and no recession. Yep. That's what will make this guy wrong. Yep. Okay. The critic continues, instead, economic growth is even stronger this year. Okay, so the recession clearly did not happen. But the question is, did the current economic policies stay the same? And therefore, the economist is wrong? Or did the economic policies change? And therefore, the prediction no longer applies to the current scenario? I'm, I don't think the economist even needs to defend herself. If that was the complaint mm-hmm. and I'm the judge. Yeah. We'd that say complaint, insufficient. That complaint is kicked out of my court, right? What was that called again? That's like, a, there's a very standard uh, thing for that. Well, it can't be summary judgment. I don't remember, but. I, mean, I think it is. It's well, summary it's judgment similar. based on the facts you one. provided. Right. I mean, in my court, I would just say, hey, this complaint is insufficient. You have yep. not alleged all of the elements that would be required in order yeah. to prove that this was a bumbling forecast. Yeah. Sorry. G- goodbye. Like just saying yeah. there was no recession, which economic growth is even stronger this year. Okay. means there is no recession. Were the policies changed or were they not? And the critic has to put that in their brief. They have to present a fact that says, actually, the policies were not changed. You know, analogies don't always work. But the thing that's nice about your analogy here is that in the court, the burden is on the plaintiff, right? To at least allege the crime. Yes. You have to allege all of the elements of the crime. And if we're talking about civil litigation, you do have to allege all the elements of the tort or whatever. 
mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna have to at least in the paper yeah. before we ever get to, and this is why you know i say this all the time but lawyers are professional readers and professional writers you don't get to the drama courtroom part if your paperwork isn't legit and mm -hmm. this critic just gets kicked out of court on the paperwork because yeah. they they failed to allege that the economic policies were not changed. It's an, it's clearly an assumption that the critic is making. This is extremely, yeah. it's extremely law school. I mean, it's exactly what law school is like. Yeah. And I was just going to say that the burden is on whoever's making the argument on the LSAT as well. So whenever you're making an argument, the burden's on you to prove your conclusion. If you fail yeah. to do that, right. you've failed. Absolutely. Read these arguments as if you were a judge and you were considering whether to let this case go forward or not. Yep. Almost always you're going to see it. You're going to go, Hey, either your logic is just completely flawed, which mm -hmm. get out, or you've failed to allege one of the elements of your crime. There's a big gap here in which case get out. Yep. Looks like the economist is going to defend herself. Yes. The economist says, there was nothing at all bumbling about my warning. Okay, you're wrong. It's just a um, conclusion, right? Who gives just a shit? Just a conclusion. Just stop yep. talking, economist. <laughs> There's some, yeah. the, surprise, the economist surprise. has a way to win this case, and yep. she does not need to say her conclusion. But anyway, she did. Indeed, it convinced the country's leaders to change economic policies, which is what prevented a recession. In other words, the if clause or the if condition that this economist based her prediction on, if current economic policies were not changed, then we'd go into a recession. That never happened. The economic policies did change. So my prediction is no longer like applicable or she, like, she defended herself on the exact same grounds that the judge would actually have just thrown this lawsuit out to begin with. Yep. If the economic condition, if the economic policies were in fact changed, then the prediction cannot have possibly been bumbling. Yep. Um, the economist to edit down the economist's defense, mm -hmm. she could have said, economic policies were changed that would have been <laughs> four words <laughs> economic <laughs> policies were changed thank you <laughs> <laughs> goodbye <laughs> yeah i mean that's the so all the conclusion and everything and like the fact that her warning is what convinced the country's leaders to change the policies none of that that's matters. interesting that brings in a whole another like can of worms because you're like wait a sec did you actually do that? But it doesn't matter because the... <laughs> the unnecessary patting herself on the back and the unnecessary statement of her conclusion. Yep. She already wins her case when she says economic policies were changed. We don't care why. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So the question says, the economist responds to the critic by... Um, this is very similar to a question that says the argument proceeds by, but specifically here they're asking about how the uh, economist's argument proceeds or how the economist responds to the critic. What type of question is this? Well, I mean, we call it a reasoning question, but it's in the larger family of top down must be true. Sure. This is, it's just, hey, what did the economist do? Yep. We're going to find one answer here that correctly describes what the economist did. Yep. There's going to be four wrong answers that misdescribe what the economist did. So it's just going to be something different from what she did or something extra. The correct answer here should be conservative, boring, obvious. It should just be like, well, yeah, your honor, the economist obviously did this thing. It's right here in the record. And the wrong answers yep. should pretty easily be like, no, nah, well, she didn't do that. She yep. just didn't. The record does not show that she did that. No, she did the opposite of that. Or she kind of did that, but this is a stronger version of what she did. That, those would all be wrong answers. 
because we need to find something that's clearly rooted in the evidence. Yep. What the economist did. Yeah. As she responded. Just did An she do it? Yep. Answer choice A. Did the economist indicate that the state of affairs on which the economist prediction was conditioned did not obtain? Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people hate this answer, but it's correct. Um, the economist did indicate, did show that the state of affairs, which is whether the economic current policies economic not policies changing. had changed or not changed, um, on which the economist prediction was conditioned. Yes, her prediction depended on whether or not the current economic policies had not changed, had stayed the same. Condition means if, yep. right? Conditional reasoning means an if-then statement. Mm -hmm. The economist's prediction was an if-then statement. If policies don't change, then there's going to be a recession. So the state of affairs that the prediction, the prediction was recession. The state of affairs that conditioned that prediction was if economic policies are not changed. And then we got a double negative now. <laughs> Did not obtain. And this is an unusual use of the word obtain, but obtain also means happen. So did not happen. They should stop doing that bullshit. I, the, what value is there in that? Honestly, you know what that is? It's like systemic, casual, unintentional racism or classism at the very least. Because you're saying only the most elite... <laughs> Yeah, nobody ever read aware. that phrase before. Normal people yeah. never read that phrase. It's like only people who have grew up reading Supreme Court opinions, you know, people with lawyer family understand that phrase because your dad uses it. But that, that they shouldn't do the shit that's like particularly only lawyers know this language. They should, there's no point having that in the LSAT. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I don't, I don't know what to make of this because I mean, there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of part of this test that's just tough. But um, I don't feel like this word in particular. This word sucks. But I also feel like you could figure it out from context. Like, did not obtain. Like, yeah. well, okay, I don't know what you mean, but I guess it didn't happen. Which kind of well, seems like. Don't let my criticism of this question be an excuse for you to miss it. Yeah. Because even if you didn't quite grasp what does not obtain means, mm -hmm. you should still be able to eliminate the four wrong answers and hopefully come back to this and reread it until you understand it. Yeah. And, and say to yourself, okay, I'm not a hundred percent sure what obtain means, but it, I can't say with confidence that it's definitely wrong. Right. But, and we can conclusively yeah. eliminate these four wrong answers. So let's, let's. And everything else in answer choice A works. So hmm, didn't maybe. obtain means didn't occur or didn't happen. Yep. Mm -hmm. But even if you hadn't seen that. Yeah. What do we think about let's, B? Yeah. B says um, the economist dis. The economist responds to the critic by distinguishing between a prediction that has not yet turned out to be correct and one that has turned out to be incorrect. There's no distinguishing going on. There's not two predictions. So this is out. I mean, and you might have to like personalize B to really understand what it means. Sure. But the, there are no words there that are fancy pants lawyer shit, right? There's no, there's nothing there that normal humans shouldn't be able to parse if they took mm -hmm. their time with it. But, you know, in order for B to be the answer, the economist would have to have said, well, there are predictions that have not yet turned out to be correct. And then there are predictions that have already turned out to be incorrect. Mm -hmm. So that would be like, uh, you know, I can't stop thinking about Trump, but if you were it, like, I have this weird feeling and maybe it's just wishful thinking that Trump is going to be like dead before the end of 2021. I, I, I don't see him in his post-presidency being healthy. 
Mm-hmm. So maybe somebody made a prediction, Trump will die before the end of 2021. Sure. Well, if I made that prediction, that prediction has not yet turned out to be correct. Yeah. Has that prediction turned out to be incorrect? <laughs> it can't possibly until the end of 2021. Yeah. So if this economist was making a distinction like that, like, well, yeah, it's not yet wrong. Oh, sorry, mm-hmm. it's not yet right. Yep. But it's also certainly not wrong. Yeah. That would be distinguishing between a prediction that has not yet turned out to be correct and one that has turned out to be incorrect. Yeah. Like on January 1st of 2022, that prediction could turn out to be incorrect. Yep. And you know, and so it's like, what? The economists yeah. did not do that shit. Yep. And so B's conclusively eliminated, even if you don't understand A, you can't pick B. Cannot pick B. Okay. Uh, The economist responds to the critic by attempting to show that the critic's statements are mutually inconsistent. Uh, The critic made an assumption. The critic left out some information, but the claims that the critic made were not mutually inconsistent with each other. In other words, incompatible. They could be- What's your example that you use to teach? I've got one, but it's it's so stale. What do you use to teach what it means to have presented mutually inconsistent or mutually incompatible statements? Uh, I don't necessarily have a go-to example, but I would just say something like um, the ground is, is wet. And then another claim that essentially says the ground is dry. I mean, okay. you yeah. can't do that, right? So can't be both wet and dry at the same time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I suppose any binary logic like complete logical opposites Mm -hmm. um or not wet (laughs) the ground is wet oh the ground is not wet those would be inconsistent statements yeah yeah i always say like x equals two and x is an odd number Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah i guess you're right like i drink coffee and i don't drink coffee there's an inconsistency there Mm-hmm. that's what c means yep it almost never happens it's almost never correct but we do see this answer <laughs> you see the, you see the answer a lot it's not yep. automatically wrong just but be- i mean it's wrong because the economist or the critic did not present inconsistent statements nor did the economist attack on those grounds yeah if this were correct you would have been reading the critics statements and been like wait you can't say that if you're reading carefully right this is something you would have spotted and be aware of yeah the critic would have to have said you predicted that we would have a recession and you predicted that we did not have a recession well wait no because that wouldn't be mutually inconsistent because the economist could have made or those your prediction <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> hmm. Anyway, it would be very specific circumstances. It would be it would be obvious that that was the answer if it were the yeah. answer. All right. Yep. D. The economist responds to the critic by offering a particular counterexample to a general claim asserted by the critic. So I bet that's what people pick if they miss it. Ooh, they they think, oh wait, um, convincing the country's leaders to change economic policies uh, is a counter example i guess in their minds or something people don't understand what counter example means Mm -hmm. i have an example please a general claim that presidents of the united states normally don't incite riots at the capitol okay Mm mm-hmm and a particular counterexample of Donald Trump. Yep. Right. That's a general claim. Presidents don't do this. Yep. And then a specific counterexample. Well, except sometimes they do. Yeah. Yep. Smoking causes cancer. Uh, Uncle, Uncle Joey smokes, died and never had cancer counter example it's an example a specific instance 
of something that goes against the more general claim. Right. Oddly enough, we don't really have anything like that. No. (laughs) Sorry, go ahead. Oh, we don't really have even a general claim in the critic statements. The critic is making a specific claim about a specific prediction. This prediction is wrong. And the economist is responding to that specific criticism. So you can get rid of D because there's no general claim. You can get rid of D because there's no counter example. So yeah, it's bad. Yep. E, the economist responds to the critic by offering evidence against. Okay, so far, so good. Because the critic, the economist is providing evidence against something. Yeah. Offering evidence against one of the critics' factual premises. So I've seen people miss this question by picking that as well. Uh, yeah. So the economist is going after an assumption, which is an unstated premise. In other words, the critic never said that the current economic policies were not changed or stayed the same. They never said that. They just assumed that. So the economist is going after one of the critics' unstated premises or assumptions, but this is saying offering evidence against one of the critics' factual premises as if it had been actually said. And it had- yeah, in order to make E the correct answer, the economist would have to have said, or one way that the economist could have made E the correct answer is if she had said, I never made that prediction. I never made that prediction. Yes, that would be going after one of the factual premises of the critic. Right. The critic you said, you made this no, prediction. The economist goes, I never made that prediction. That yeah. would be evidence against one of the factual premises of the critic's argument. Or in, when the critic said, instead, economic growth is even stronger this year, the economist could say, no, it wasn't. No, there was a recession. It's not stronger. It's actually worse. It's in a recession. Right. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Those would be attacking the actual facts that the critic presented. Instead, what really happened here, and you know, I think the best teaching, th- I think it's probably useful that we went through those wrong answers because I can see people being attracted by them. But if you're too reliant on the answer choices, you're being passive anyway. And the real pro approach to this question we attacked the critic's argument. Mm -hmm. We said, hey, were the economic policies changed or not? Because you left that out of your argument. The economist did defend on exactly those grounds. And then the correct answer, A, is correctly describing, I mean, in annoying language, but yeah, the economist said, hey, my prediction was based on economic policies not changing. Mm-hmm. That didn't happen. Economic policies did change. So then you can't accuse me of my prediction being wrong. And the answer turns out to be A. And I guess the thing that I really want to sh- show people here is how much, if you're doing these questions actively, you're just compressing the, the, the test down. It's like we're doing so much of an easier version of the test. Yep. You know, if you raced through the critic's statement and didn't see the glaring hole, then you might not understand the economist's defense. (laughs) You clearly don't understand what A means then. And now you're going through all these, some of them more attractive and some of them less attractive, trap wrong answers, hoping that the answer choices explain it to you. And I promise you, if you're slow at logical reasoning, that's why. Because Ben would have taken 30 seconds on this question. Ben would have gone, you know, take take plenty of time on the critic's statement, but clearly recognize, dude, you didn't even allege that the economic policies weren't changed. It's an assumption of your argument. That's a big problem. And then the economist goes, yeah, we changed economic policies. Boom. A perfectly describes it. You would take about five seconds to get rid of B, C, D, E. The answer is A and you're moving on. It's like no sweat, right? It's just like a, it's like a, a, a less stressful, less effortful 
way of doing the test because you're doing it actively instead of doing it passively. And it all starts from reading carefully at the very top. Yep. It's I think a that word- life challenge, right? Do you want to do less work <laughs> now or more work in the future? <laughs> it, is per- it is perfectly applicable in legal contexts. Man, you want your first filing to be perfect. Yep. If your first filing isn't perfect, you open yourself up to a whole world of trouble. Yeah. You know, and so they are testing how careful you are. They're testing how detail oriented. Yes, they're testing your like English abilities for sure. But they're also just testing how how patient and how careful you are in applying those English abilities. And it, it, the, t- the whole test just opens up to you. It becomes so much easier. I mean, I, don't, I do not think that this is a hard question at all. If you noticed the giant hole in the critic's argument, because the economist does attack that hole and A describes that attack. And we, like, we basically predicted the answer at the end of the critic's argument. By the way, <laughs> a little bit of a tangent, but I think related. Um, I started watching OJ Simpson versus the people or whatever it's People called. versus OJ. Isn't it people great? People versus OJ. Yeah. And um, at, at the beginning, uh, his attorney, Shapiro, I think, yep. uh, he said, OJ or Juice or whatever he said, we got to stay ahead of this. We got to stay ahead of the media and everything that's going to come at you. And, you know, aside from the fact that OJ was guilty and we, you know, <laughs> yeah. we shouldn't be trying to figure out how to help him win. Uh, his attorney was right. If you want to win this, you have to stay ahead. You have to anticipate what's coming. And that's what good attorneys do. I'm not saying it's moral. But if you want to be a good attorney and do your job, that's what you have to do. And you have to do it here. You have to stay ahead of these arguments. You can't be like kicked around. You have to be like, whoa, buddy, this is where you're wrong. And I'm anticipating that error. If the other person, if the economist doesn't catch it, it doesn't matter. You did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's much of a tangent at all. I mean, I think it has perfect applicability to this logical reasoning question and just attacking the LSAT on the whole. You, you need to, you know, you need to expect the arguments to be bad. You need to expect them to try to pull a fast one on you. You need to be prepared for them to leave something out, prepared for them to make an obvious logical flaw. You gotta be, you gotta be on the offensive Instead mm-hmm. of just sitting back passively and waiting for bad shit to happen to you, you have to be like on your toes and expecting and ready to attack them. We, we were already attacking the critic and then the economist in a somewhat bumbling fashion with too many extra words did defend the way we would have defended. And then the answer turns out to be A, <laughs> like literally it would have taken five seconds taken five seconds to go through b c d e to know that those weren't the answers after reading a yeah and it just you make an easy question out of what could have been a hard one i can imagine people taking five minutes on this question and missing it yep and that's all because they didn't read the critics argument well enough in the first place yeah um we are on facebook instagram twitter youtube all the social medias at thinking elsa and elsa demon I specifically want to point you to our YouTube channels. We're putting tons of great content. Well, we think it's great. Um, The best we got, we're putting out on uh, Thinking LSAT and LSAT Demon YouTube channels. So highlights from the show on Thinking LSAT, highlights from our live classes are going out on LSAT Demon. So lots of free shit. We're trying to be as helpful as we can. Um, Follow us on both of those channels on YouTube, please. Um, leave us a review on iTunes. If you get a chance, if you've listened this far, you must like the show, write a few words, please, about what you like about the show it helps us a lot. If you want to get on the agenda for the show, it's help at thinking Ask us any question you want. Um, if you have questions about the LSAT demon, 
that's help at lsatdemon.com, including if you do qualify for the LSAC fee waiver, please email proof of that to help at lsatdemon.com for free shit and significant discounts. That was episode 279 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. <laughs>